All right, today on Home But Not Alone, we're going to share with you some of our favorite Catholic books. Um, so we're trying something new this time. And for the first time, we're going to try to record the video with it. Hello, you can see us now. And we're going to post that over on YouTube. So if you're listening to us on podcast and you want to check it out on YouTube, we're going to just give this a try and see how it goes. So head on over there. But for today, um, we're really excited because we can actually show you our stacks of books. Look, mine is really big. Ugh. <laughs> Those are my favorite books. So we're going to go through them. I think Tim's got a stack of books over there, too. So hey, Tim. Hey, Sarah. Yeah, I can't pretend to, like, be listening. I have to actually be attentive now. And I can't pretend to be groomed. I have to actually be, you know, <laughs> look moderately, like, hair. If I'm what do you mean, pretend to be listening? Do you not listen to me? <laughs> I do. I do. I'm joking. I'm making fun of myself. That's all. That's all. The I truth have comes a long, out. long history of self-deprecating humor. I just, I don't know. It's... I, it's really easy. I remember hearing years ago the talk show host Conan O'Brien saying something about he does not like to make jokes at the expense of others. That just degrades them. He didn't use the word degrade, but that's what he meant. And I thought, I've kind of done the same thing for a long time. I don't want to make fun of other people. I don't know where their sensitivities are. I don't know where their past hurt is. But I certainly know what I can make fun of about myself. And so... I mean, to this day, I tell people, well, why do I have a beard? Well, because there was a picture of me in 2013, I think, in the St. Louis Catholic Review newspaper. Um, yeah, the St. Louis newspaper called The Review. I didn't have a beard, but I did have a shaved head. And imagine what uh, a giant toe would look like with no name. That's what I looked like. If you slapped a face on that, that's exactly what I looked like. So <laughs> the beard does not look like I'm part of a foot. So uh. that's not at all what we're talking about today. But um, so we're talking about, what are we talking about? You tell us. Our favorite Catholic books. So I want to start with, I, I feel like I'm cheating, but I want to start with my two biggies. I got here my catechism and my Bible. So I, is, is that cheating? No, it's not cheating. <laughs> It's only thing if you sit there and do the, the Bible is one book. Well, no, the Bible's a library of books. Yes, it is technically, because it's all the different genres and all the different individual books. But no, that's not cheating. That's, we, we fall into this nonsense where we treat, as Catholics, too often we treat the Bible like it's, oh, scriptures for Protestants. And I'm like, what? Like, it, like we do that, though. I think there's this yeah. Oh, yeah. joking attitude. So no, we need to embrace that. Plus the catechism. I mean, twist ending is what I got to No, I'm kidding. That's... <laughs> I was like, what's the twist ending in the catechism? <laughs> no, that's what I say with my kids' books. When I get to the end of a four-page board book, I'm like, oh, twist ending. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that flap was going to be a monkey. Yes, I did. I read it a thousand times. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> did you put your Bible in your pile of your favorite books? What Bible do you have? I have this one. I put it in one pile of Ah, uh, okay. Mine is the RSV. I like the RSV. I like the RSV too. This is this this is one I got as a gift like 15 years ago, and that's why I use it mostly is because one, I don't want to go buy a new one, and two, it's just been the one I've taken with me on retreats and stuff before. So yeah, the Bible you have is the best Bible. That's what they say, right? Do you I'm write in your Bible? I need to. Everybody says, you know, when you use your Bible, when you really dive into it, have a highlighter with you, huh. you know, something, leave some notes. And I, I never do. So I've been telling myself for like four months, start doing that. So, you know, <laughs> well, I underlined something in my Bible the other day for the first time, like to Ooh. me, that's yeah. So that was a big deal to me. I was like, I'm going to dive in. And I'm going to underline this, but I don't, mine has the really thin pages. So it's really not that good for writing in an underlining, but maybe someday I'll get one of those that's made for it. But for now I have this one, I read it and I love it. I like how it has, it has like the little pronunciation things like you have in the dictionary so that I know how to, I used to lecture at mass. So I'd have to know how to say all those crazy Bible words. How about your catechism? You get your catechism with you? Oh, you have the same one. Yeah. I'm split in half in the middle and my pages are starting to fall out. <laughs> uh, mine has one note card marked and uh, no surprise, it's male and female, he created them, which is exactly essential. 
John Paul II's Theology of the Body. He's titled yeah. Man and Man and Woman yeah. He Created. So I was just reading that yesterday because, you know, I'm me. Uh, yeah, but. you're the theology of the body guy. Well, so I used to just take my catechism like a reference book and I would look up stuff like I want to know this. So I'll look it up in the catechism. But just this year, finally, um, my husband and I are reading the catechism cover to cover. And it's intense, but it's like it's only like 10 paragraphs a day and we should get through it in the year. But I've been under, I, I decided to dive in with writing my book in my books in the catechism. So I've been underlining like everything. <laughs> but um, yeah, and making notes in it. And I don't know, it's some of the things is like, I knew it, but I didn't really know it as deeply as the catechism tells me about it. And so I'm discovering when I'm reading this front to back, it's like, oh my goodness, there's so much in here. So have you have you ever read it front to back? No, no, okay. and I would like to. I would like to. I was just listening to somebody the other day talk about if you want to be an apologist professionally, which I don't consider myself that, you need to have read the entire catechism. And I thought, that sounds like so much reading. That sounds very, like, and I want to because there's so much good stuff in there. But I think one of the big differences between, I mean, yeah, forget about its length for a second. Even just, okay, it's, a lot. Um, it doesn't, it's a catechism. It doesn't have a narrative. It doesn't have this like driving thing to get you through uh, a story where right. as you, you know, so I think that that's one of my hangups. And so I still use it as, as a reference on a regular basis. I will find. Which is good. Yes. Um, I'll find something I like or, or I don't know, one particular line and then that'll get me to maybe read a few pages or a few paragraphs or something, because it's not just this, you know, like, well, here's one quote. That's the entire thing. Like, no, it builds yeah. upon, you know, so. Well, do you ever, ever get stuck like in the catechism rabbit trail where you go look up those, the marks on the, on the edges, you know, those, those reference marks to the other paragraphs. I know what you're talking about. I've done it. I don't do it often. It does <laughs> often, usually because. I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I get so confused by the first thing I'm reading that I have to stick with it for a while, even though I'm like, ooh, this reference is something else. Now, when I'm trying to really figure something else or figure something out, I will end up going down the rabbit hole. The problem is then it'll be like, you know, hey, this will take you to this, which takes you to this, which takes you to this, takes you to this. Takes you to this. And it, eventually I'm like, I don't remember what my original question was because it's taken me to all of these areas. And it right. is, you know, that illustrates the fact that Catholicism is not this like hashtag theology sort of situation where you can explain any church teaching with pull out one scripture verse, boom, there's the teaching. No, right. or right. here's my one line it can fit in a tweet or, you know, whatever it may be. Right. Uh, I think that's that really illustrates that fact and that we need to realize there is depth to things. There's layers. This is explained over here. This is explained over here. This is explained here, here, and here. But then all of those are explained elsewhere, you know. So yeah. there's a lot to it. Um, like big, it's, it's a web. It can be complicated and sometimes confusing, but very rich and just fascinating if you're, you know, willing to allow yourself to kind of dive into it. So anybody who's never picked up the catechism and, and read it, even just as a reference, go look something up in it. Like today, before the end of the day, before you go to bed, just go open it up and read something. It's really cool. Or look something up that you've been wondering about. Find it in the index and head over to the paragraphs. And I think it's a really good goal. I, I love that my husband is reading it with me front to back because we're kind of keeping ourselves accountable. So put that on your bucket list, right? <laughs> Yeah. Now I have and I know okay. the catechetical dictionary. Do you have one of these? On no, but I have this dictionary. <laughs> this is my modern Catholic dictionary. Oh, you have that too. Ah. I like this one. Father Hardin, he's good. Yeah. Oh, this is yeah, this is fantastic. Um, I got. But this tell one. me about that catechetical dictionary. So, like, how is that different? So. The stuff that's in here is only stuff from the catechism. So there are things where, like, I go and I'm like, I want to look something up. And I pull this out. Um, and it's not in there. And then I realize, oh, that's not defined in the cat. Or that's not a definition of a word that you find necessarily in the catechism. Um, this is Catholicism. So, you know, it's taller. It's thicker. <laughs> the print is definitely smaller. It's, anyway. Oh, um, okay. 
there's actually a lot more to Catholicism in this one. This is specifically helpful when using this. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so I'm just realizing that anyone listening to this on audio has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're showing all these books and we forgot that we, we yep. right? not everybody's looking at the video. So you got that catechetical dictionary and the modern Catholic dictionary. Yes. So the modern Catholic dictionary, very helpful with all things Catholic. The catechetical dictionary, helpful with the catechism. And sometimes I like to use both when referencing the catechism because they'll give me, it's not different definitions, but <laughs> they'll expand on things maybe in different ways. Yeah. Uh, or cover different aspects yeah. of something. So, I mean, um, we were just diving into some different definitions in the two dictionaries the other day. So it really is it's just fascinating. Yeah. So it's, yeah. My next? Yeah, go. I've got Intro to the Devout Life by Francis DeSales. Have you ever read it? I have not, and I've been told to read it, and I haven't. Maybe I've been told by Look, you. mine still has sticky notes in it. Um, so this was the first book that, like, in my adult faith life really got me wanting to take living my faith seriously. Um, so this is what launched me wanting to like research the virtues and learn how to meditate. Like I had never really learned the art of the prayer of meditation before. I mean, meditating like during the rosary and stuff. But when I read this, he, he has like, you know, some practical life advice and he talks about a few different virtues, but he also talks about he leads you through a series of meditations, like really deeply, step by step. And I remember reading this and being like, holy cow, I want to learn how to meditate. Um, and so I tried it and I absolutely fell in love with it. And I, I still like, that's one of my favorite ways to pray is to, you know, meditate kind of in the style that he outlines in this book. Um, but another thing is like, some of it is a little dated. So he talks about how like um, women should never wear braids. And like, I know that's in the Bible too. St. Paul says it in one of his letters. He says like, you should not wear braids and stuff. But it's like, I, I think it was a different, um, you know, different set of customs, like different meaning. Now it's like, I can't get through my day without eventually putting my hair in a braid. <laughs> it's my he, mom, easy hairdo. Thing. And I'm trying to remember where it was, but he made comments about, about facial hair and, and different things like that. And I remember somebody, I don't know, Jimmy Aiken or Trent Horner, somebody from Catholic Answers was talking about that one time. And they were like, yeah, it's not what we would think it means in the 21st century. So it's, you know, even though St. Paul may have said some things about braids, <laughs> what the context was. I'm not sure who, so often in scripture, we don't know, like we know who the audience was, but we don't know anything about them. Like okay. if I were say, you know, oh yeah, you know, St. Paul's letter to the, uh, the, uh, the, I don't know what you say about people that Minnesotans, let's say that. St. Paul's letter to Minnesotans. Those who are in Minnesota know things about Minnesota. Yes, right. Plus, not in Minnesota also know some things about Minnesota. Right. Uh, especially if we're paying attention to, say, news or politics or different, you know, things that are going on. Well, the first century Jews, when they were reading the scriptures, second century Jews, when they were reading the scriptures, they were like, oh, yeah, I remember what was happening in Minnesota. You know, essentially, that's <laughs> you know, Minnesota, it's literally the first state I thought of. Um, but it's that sort of thing. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I think I, I understand why some of that seems dated and maybe a little confusing to right yeah so if you can filter out that though overall it is a really good book and especially if you want to like start taking um your faith more seriously it, it really totally like launched my my faith life like early adult faith life so highly recommend it it will always be one of my faves i'm gonna i'm gonna go a completely different direction than you okay okay i have john paul ii for dummies okay <laughs> I love this book. I absolutely do. I used to have the Four Dummies version uh, of Catholicism, which is so good. And I feel like, you know, so it's Catholicism for dummies. And yeah. I, 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 I must have given it to somebody who needed it or something like that. But, I mean, this is a... <laughs> Some dummy. <laughs> what is this? is a, a 350-page book on John Paul II. And it has, it has charts 
and it has, you know, it's all broken up into sections that you can easily understand. Um, it has a few pictures, you know, so that's always nice for those of us yeah. who like pictures. Um, but, you know, even things like, you know, I'm just going to flip to a random page here. Um, expanding on the responsibilities of the laity. And then it's, you know, just four paragraphs of stuff, not exactly what he said, but addressing what he may have done or said in regards to that. Mm. Um, you know, and talks about uh, when he got shot, it talks about, you know, set, it says setting the stage for the rise of total totalitarianism. Uh, uh, um, his so it's like, it's like accurate though. It's a trustworthy, okay. It's not a bunch of nonsense. It was written by, um, what is it? Two Catholic priests, three Catholic priests. Oh. Catholic priests. So, um, and these are the same, uh, two of these three priests uh, also wrote Catholicism for Dummies and Women in the Bible for Dummies. So okay. they're, they're actually, they're great starting points. They're great references. Yeah. And it's surprisingly thorough, uh, but without having to, you know, have a deep theological background, without having to have a, a huge, be like, oh yeah, I understand all of the ecclesiastical terms, and so I'm going to open this book. This is like, hey, Let's give it to Tim, you know, and then I'm like, oh, okay, look at this, you know, so. Oh, you know. that's good, because I don't think I ever really um, maybe fully trusted the For Dummies series of books, but that's good kind of knowing that, like, you trust it, that makes me trust it a little more. I've not, and, and obviously I can't gar make any guarantees. I haven't searched the entire no. book, every book for every mistake. <laughs> Checked every reference. <laughs> but, um. I have yet to find anything in here that I wasn't like, yeah, no, that's in line with what happened or what the church teaches or, you know, whatever it may be. So yeah. what else do you have for us? I have, this book is called Conversion. It's by Father Donald Haggerty. And this is my latest spiritual reading book. And yeah. it is incredible. I was supposed to read it over Lent. I was like, this is the book I'm going to read for Lent. And I just finished it like last week. So it took me several months, um, but it's, and I underlined basically every other line in here because it was just that good. It was so amazing. But so what this is, is obviously it's about conversion, uh, but it really is like reflective and helps you dig into your spiritual life and like where you are in your journey to like giving your whole heart to Jesus. And I have, you know, I've read some things about the spiritual life, like I read Intro to the Devout Life, and I've read a little bit of, you know, theology here and there, but I have never thought so deeply about my personal spiritual life and, sure. like, where I am, where I've been, where I'm going, um, and all the complexities of it until I read this book. And, I mean, maybe it sounds a little ridiculous, like, but it's, I don't know, it was just, like, a mind-blowing look, like, into my own spiritual life. And I mean, I took it very personally when I read this book, like everything I read, it was like, does that apply to me or doesn't it? Am I not there? Am I there? Like, is that where I'm going? Is this a goal? Is this something I've been through? Does it completely not apply to me? Uh, but it was just incredible. So if you've never actually like sat down and thought about your spiritual life, like your conversion, you know, your, your past path, like in depth, um, and where you're going from here, holy cow. So pick up this book. It's called Conversion uh, by Father Donald Haggerty. The entire thing of everything you said, I listened to it, I promise. But <laughs> the thing that stuck out to me was, I love that you used the phrase, I took it personally, but you didn't mean that in a, oh, I was so offended. Like that's no. how it, that phrase. And I can't stand that because you can take something personally we take a lot of things personally without them being like uh, taking offense with anyone. So. No, no. Yeah. Like it, it just, it was me reading. It was like, this is about my life. Obviously this guy doesn't know me, but um, <laughs> so that's what I meant by I took it personally. What's next on your list? I'm going to, I'm going to pull up two at once. Cause I'm crazy. Okay. Uh, okay. So we have love and responsibility by John Paul II from before he was John Paul II. Um, and don't make me pronounce his last name because I always butcher it. He, even at my own confirmation, when the bishop said, "What? What is? What was the name of the pope before he took the name?" And I, I promise, I looked right at a bishop of the Catholic Church and said, "Um, K 
Carol something. And as not like not like Carl as in you know Charles, the Polish of Charles, but like Carol, like some ladies. And my mother told me later on, my grandma burst out laughing from the back of the church. No. And not to not in a way of making fun of me, but she thought it was awesome that that was my answer. Right. Uh, but we have Love and Responsibility, okay. which was <clears throat> a series of talks that John Paul II gave in 1958 and 1959. This was initially published in 1960. Uh, and then we have Man and Woman, He Created Them, or better known as John oh. Paul's Theology of the Body, which was a series of talks he gave during his papacy from 78 to 84. I believe it was 78 to 84. 79 to 84. Uh, now I should know that. Um, but he did that, and then that eventually became his, you know, what's known as his theology of the body. Um, I don't, I have never read these cover to cover. That was going to be my next question. Have you read them cover to cover? I don't think I could read them from the front to the back. These to me are books I study. I yeah. regularly listen to lectures on them. I will read sections of it and then just sit with it. Uh, I cannot read it from beginning to end because it's too much. It's absolutely too much. Um, and it doesn't, it flows very well. But okay. again, just like with the catechism, it's not a narrative. And there's so much depth to it that, and it's in a language that, yeah, it, it's, it's in English, obviously. I don't read any of <laughs> I'm not I'm not that kind of talented in any way. Uh, big points to anyone who reads multiple languages. That's that's incredible. Uh, but I I use these books because, or I read these books and I, I sit there and I study them and I'm like, what is a section? And what, I need to learn more about it from professors. And mm. I was just listening to a, a 40 minute talk on YouTube about one portion of this book this morning, and I had to pause and back up that that lecture 20 times at different points. <laughs> Like, I got to listen to those words again. They were, right. it was way too much. And even then, I'm going to have to go back and listen to it multiple times right. before I really start to have that small portion down. So okay. I love books. I think if more people tried to understand them or what was in them, people tried, were able to understand or whatever, we'd have so many healthier relationships. We would have people understanding who they are better. I mean, it's the foundation of the ministry work I do. So I'm very mm, happy right. about it these two texts. Do you have anything else for us? Yeah. Um, so let's um, see. Yeah, I have a few left in my pile. I got three left in my pile. So I, I'll pull up this one, Treasure and Tradition. Um, so we've been going to the Latin Mass more often. And the first time we went, it was like, holy cow, this is beautiful. But we have no clue what's going on. And so I, I reached out to a few friends who are very familiar with the Latin Mass. I'm like, how do I figure out what's going on in this crazy Mass? And they're like, get this book, Treasure and Tradition. Um, so I got it under the guise of getting it for my son. Um, but really, I got it because I wanted to read it and figure out what is going on. And it is absolutely gorgeous. So first of all, it taught us like what the heck is going on in the Latin Mass, which is a lot more similar to the English math than you'd think. Um, there are some differences, but it's it's incredible. Once I figured out what the parts were, it's like, oh yeah, I recognize this, I recognize this, I recognize, it's that same mass. Um, we've talked about this before, but anyways, I figured out what was going on in the Latin mass, but also it tells you about what the mass is. So it talks about the parts of the mass, but it also talks about like the reasons of the mass, where this comes from, where you find this in scripture, or what this custom means. Um, so it's an incredible resource not just if you go to the Latin Mass, but if you're interested in diving a little deeper into what the Mass is like at its core. And it's just beautiful. It has amazing illustrations Ooh. and it's just gorgeous. So I love it. This is a treasure in our house. So um, I'm going to, this is one that a lot of Catholics, especially those who have kids who are married, have probably at least heard of this book. Maybe they were given it when they were engaged, but it's, it's Christopher West's The Good News About Sex and Marriage. Now, I love this book. This is the old uh, one that even Christopher, I heard him make fun of it as, oh yeah, the purple book, you know, whatever. But then they also did a, a revised edition, um, which frankly has a much prettier cover. Yeah, uh, much. More appealing cover. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I'm, of course I'm the guy with multiple copies of this book, but 
I this is maybe my favorite book because it takes the theology of the body and breaks it down. And it's not everything. It's not, you know, cumulative covering everything in John Paul II's work, but it really does take church teaching and present it in a way that the average person like me can actually understand and then hopefully take those things and apply it to their marriage. And so I actually, I, not only do I have two physical copies of this book, and then I had another one I gave away not too long ago, I, I have the audio version of the book. Well, you can listen to it too. <laughs> I do it as well because I actually prefer <laughs> audio books over, over paper books. Um, well, I let love- me tell you my objection to that book because I know you have a good answer to this, but I never I- liked that book. Okay. Um, and the reason is because, and I mean, maybe this is just me being a cradle Catholic and never being like argumentative against the church's teachings. Yeah. I find that book to be really argumentative because it's in the question and answer format. And it's like, here's an argument, blah, blah, blah. This is why the church is wrong. And then he gives the answer to why it's right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what if I identify more with the argument than with the answer? Sure. Um, well, first of all, you might identify more with the argument than okay. the answer. <laughs> Problem long term. You're right. Um, Structurally, I think it makes sense for two reasons. One, that's uh, not that we all have to be Thomas Aquinas, but that's how Aquinas did things. You know, he did the argument against the church, and and he he steel manned the thing. He didn't straw man it and build the weak argument against the church. He would often build a stronger argument against the church than his own opponents could on their own behalf. So he would do that. And then he would still present enough information to demonstrate that he was correct. So it is possible uh, to identify with the question. But one, Thomas Aquinas, he used that. It's a pretty effective method in evangelization because one, it says to whoever is objecting, I see where you're coming from. Here, I'm ignoring your, here's what the truth is. Take it and leave it. Take it or leave it, whatever. You don't (laughs) it. Um, but I understand okay. where you're coming from. Here's your objection. And so I'm going to then respond to where you may be already. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, the other thing is, is this book along with a lot of the theology, of the body stuff, um, and you know, your, some, some of your humana vitae to a lesser extent is the church responding to objections. So, most of us are taught the objections to Catholic teaching without even realizing it. Uh, we just see things in media. We see things in our families. We see things in our friends' families or in school or whatever it may be. And so we're taught the objections. I, as an adult, I can look back and go, oh, my gosh, yeah, I kind of thought this way because I was never taught any other way. But this just sort of seeped into the culture or into my life or whatever it may have been. So. I think most of us know the objections and a lot of us live the objections, whether we realize it or not. So I think a book like this, oh, here's the prettier cover. Uh, A book like this actually is designed not just to instruct, but also to respond. Because one of the criticisms I've heard from Protestants about, well, the Catholic Church didn't speak up on X until Y year. And, you know, X topic until Y year. And I think um, the now I'm just picturing a math graph. I must be turning into you um, with the <laughs> X and Y axis. Um, but the uh, if if everybody sort of abs- accepts the truth or what the church teaches as truth, uh, there's really no reason to spend any time right. correcting people or clarifying or publicly stating something in a, in a definitive way because everybody's already on board. So, you know, we had, I mentioned before, we had uh, Love and Responsibility published in 1960. Humanae Vitae was published in 68. Um, And Theology of the Body was first published in, um, I want to say 85 was the first in Italy, was the first time they published it as a single volume. And so what was happening in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s? Well, a lot of that sexual revolution stuff. So in many ways, these writings are a response. A response, okay. Happening. So I think it fits because of that. Uh, yeah. But there is always the danger that somebody will look at something and say, no, I still don't buy it. 
but I, I think it's still the best way to present the argument. So does that, I'll accept is that, that. Yeah, right. I'll accept that. Sounds good to me. There. Next one, on, <laughs> next one on my list is King of the Golden City. Um, have you read this? This is like a kid's book. No, I haven't. It's a kid's book, but it's like one of my favorite books because it's about this little girl um, and her encounter with the king, who is Jesus. It's this whole allegory, but every time, and we have it on audiobook as well, every time I read it, I'm like crying because it, it, it leads like through her spiritual life. Like she meets Jesus, she makes this really good first Holy Communion, and then, well, then she starts to get distracted before communion, and like it doesn't put it that way, but you see it in your mind because it's just so apparent what it's about and about her whole journey to heaven. And like, it hits me in the heart every single time. And my children absolutely love it. So we put it on the audiobook usually, but I just read it and I cry. And I think I discovered that there's a version like for boys. So the main character's a boy, not a little girl. I got to get that for my son because it is just such a good book. Um, it's, it's like you said, um, you know, there's a narrative, there's a story but it's so instructive the whole time and it's just beautiful. So King of the Golden City. I only have one more, so what else do you have? Well, um, real quick, I have, I have two that I wrote down that were, there's a guy named Lino Rulli and he has a radio show on Sirius XM's The Catholic Channel. Yeah, and he wrote two books that I've listened to on audiobook. First one's called Sinner because he asked a bunch of people, he was writing his first book, and he said, what should I call my first book? And he says, literally every single person who he, uh, he asked said, a book you're writing, what's it about? Stories about your life? Call it Sinner. So, it's, <laughs> but no, he is he's a funny, <laughs> funny guy. And I would say he's, he's kind of Catholic comedy, but he's not like stand-up comedy. He's a radio host. Um, and it's usually uh, funny stuff, for the most part. Um, and so he had this book saying, oh, and he has the, just the most self-deprecating sense of humor I've ever heard. And it's fantastic. Uh, but his first book, Sinner, his second book, Saint, they are stories from his life about Catholicism. But they're not boring. Like, you know, sometimes you hear somebody and it's like, I'm going to tell you the stories, stories from my life about how I came to Jesus. And you're like, "That's I'm so happy you found Jesus. I don't care about this story that much. Like, the details are important to you, but... They're not that important to me. Um, and I think sometimes people write, you know, entire books or whatever about that. And you're like, um, anyway, um, this is not but that. But these are of, good stories. These are good stories. They're related okay. stories. My favorite one, and I won't tell the whole thing, but it's basically, he talks about how he didn't go to confession for many, many years. And then the first time he went in college, he walked into the room and there was this guy sitting on a beanbag chair with another beanbag chair. And the guy was like, basically, I'm making up the name, but it's like, come on in, I'm John. And Lino's like, I hope you mean like Father John. Like, what is going on? It was way too laid back. Lino did not like it at all. I don't the, like that. I'm uncomfortable just listening to you talk about this. Yes. And then <laughs> he didn't go for several more years. The next time he went was at the Vatican with a priest who barely spoke English and got mad at him the whole time because <gasps> he wasn't good enough at confessing. And it's like... Those are two polar opposite yes. experiences, and they are both horrible. And yes. so, anyway, <laughs> he has tons of great stories where people can relate to the struggle of being a real everyday Catholic. So, his book Sinner and his book Saint, um, I'd recommend both of those. What uh, What's your last one? What do you have? My last one is my own book. Uh, <laughs> famous plug, love it. But oh yeah, I had. To, I mean, I could talk about Catholic books without talking about my own book. So it's called Becoming Holy, One Virtue at a Time. It's by Our Sunday Visitor. Talks about the theological and cardinal virtues. Just go check it out. We'll put a link to all of these books um, that we mentioned in the show notes um, so that you guys can check out whatever you find interesting. So we want to thank you guys for, for listening or watching today. We really appreciate that. Um, if you could do us a big favor, and if you're listening to this, go over to our YouTube channel and, and subscribe there. And if you're on the YouTube channel, subscribe there, please. Maybe share this to some with, with someone. Sarah, where can people find you? My website is tojesussincerely.com, and I'm on Facebook and Instagram at tojesussincerely. And you can find me at chastelove.org or 
on you know Instagram, Facebook, whatever at the Chase Love. Now, sin is a lot like dirty laundry. If you let it pile up too long, your whole dwelling is going to start to stink. And remember, you're never alone.